Continuing my discussions about the quantum ether, I wanted to talk about what physicists get wrong about it. And they get a lot wrong. And first I want to apologize about my voice. I've been sick for the last few days and hopefully it's not too bad. And the first and most important thing they get wrong is virtual particles are real. And physicists have long said that virtual particles are imaginary. And the problem is either physics is based on things that are real or it's based on things that are imaginary. And if it's imaginary, it's called science fiction, which is first and foremost fiction. It's not physics. In physics, we need to deal with things that we think are real. And we must have a medium in order to have real physics in the first place, in order to get away from action at a distance. And over the last 120 years, virtual particles, the zero point field, the quantum field, the quantum ether, whichever word you want to use for it, is the best theory we have. And so that's the one I use. And one of the first parts of that is electromagnetic fields and waves have an ether medium. They must have a medium. I mean, electromagnetic fields and waves are observable. They're measurable. We can detect them which, in my mind, anything we can observe, measure, detect, is real. Whether it's direct or indirect. Although, if it's an indirect detection, that usually implies we're using a theory to back up what we think we're seeing, and theories may be questionable. But that aside, electromagnetic fields and waves are very well grounded in experiment. They are real and they require a real medium and that medium is the quantum ether and the same thing is true with photons if you have electromagnetic fields and waves as having an ether medium then photons do too because that's what they are although photons have the additional property of a rotating electromagnetic field that appears to have a dipole in the middle and so that dipole in the middle needs to be a real thing for it to be real physics. And that goes back to the de Broglie model of the photon that I've discussed before. And then inertia has to be an ether interaction. A body moves through space, it interacts with something that gives it inertia. And in the case of the quantum ether, it causes it to rotate and its rotation causes the object to keep moving is the best way to imagine it, a self-inductive effect. And then special relativity and general relativity are based on the quantum ether. In both cases, you have to start with the quantum field to understand what's going on. And in both cases, you find that what's going on is an interaction with the photons and the ether because it's a change in the dielectric, a change in permittivity and permeability of space. And that's a big subject that I won't go into here. And then we have electromagnetic and gravitational acceleration. If I use one magnet to push a second magnet through the quantum ether, that means that the quantum ether is pushing the second magnet. And then we have the Casimir effect where two plates get pushed together and the quantum ether is pushing the two plates together. So there's a mechanism in the quantum ether that pushes objects together in electromagnetic interactions. But once you have that, then we already have a cause of acceleration that's responsible for gravity. And what we have is uh, Fatio Lesage effect, where two bodies are shielding each other from the pressure coming from the other direction. So there's less of a force pushing the bodies apart than there is pushing them together. And this force is emanating from the quantum ether. And then there's a bunch of false problems that physicists have identified with this type of quantum ether model that aren't really problems. And one is, ether does not cause drag. 
Another is ether does not heat objects. Both of these have been used as an opposition to the Fatio Lesage gravity, and neither one of them's ever been a problem. The Casimir effect exists, and it doesn't cause objects to heat up to the vaporizing point. That's not a thing. It's not real physics. And then if we go back to electromagnetic fields, if we have a polarizable medium that's needed for electromagnetic fields and waves to produce, then that medium produces the permittivity and permeability and the speed of light itself, which includes the impedance of free space. And it also must produce the electric charge unit and the fine structure constant and Planck's constant and all other constant and all other constants. So basically you get all of electromagnetic field theory emerging from a polarizable quantum ether. They're not, um, it's not imaginary physics again, like you're taught in school. It's not all imaginary with poof, these things just appear. They don't just appear. They're, they emerge from something, and that thing they emerge from is the quantum ether. And then as part of that, all of quantum electrodynamics emerge from the quantum ether, as been shown through mechanisms identified as stochastic quantum mechanics and stochastic electrodynamics, that you actually have real physical interactions that cause the quantum mechanics to occur. The hidden variables aren't hidden. They've never been hidden. The hidden variables are the quantum ether. The vacuum fluctuations are causing the interactions that cause quantum mechanics. And then going back to inertia, once you have a self-inductive form of inertia, ether causes a Maxwellian inertial force, a non-electric inertial force, because bodies are constantly interacting with the ether, and because the speed of light limit is the same for non-charged bodies as charged bodies, it means that's still a function of the permittivity and permeability of the quantum field. So it has the same type of mathematical framework as identified by Maxwell and Heaviside that we use for electromagnetic forces. And that gives us a whole bunch of different force interactions that are ignored today. And then going back to the physical constants, I've shown that the mass of the electron, the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron can be shown to be coming from the quantum ether. That those particles scatter electrons and so they scatter quantum fluctuations, so they displace quantum fluctuations and the amount of quantum fluctuations they displace, their zero point energy is equal to the mass energy of those basic particles. So we can derive mass without having to believe in a Higgs boson. It can come directly from the quantum ether and much more simply. And then relativistic mass comes from the ether. Going back to inertia, if you have inertial energy, it produces a quantum field inertial effect of some sort, and that effect causes the body to keep moving, which causes inertia. But that means that half of the kinetic energy is in the quantum field. And so as you keep getting to higher and higher energy, you get higher and higher energy in the field itself. And this can be treated as relativistic mass, but it's really inertial mass. It's not relativistic mass at all. And it has nothing to do with the particle gaining mass. It just means that it's gaining more inertial energy. So relativistic mass is a quantum field effect. 
And then one thing that I calculated is that the Casimir effect equals the strong force. If you look at the equation for the Casimir effect, it varies to the distance to the fourth power. And so even though it's weak at larger distances, eventually it's going to be stronger than the Coulomb repulsion between two protons because they vary with the distance squared. It turns out that these forces cross at about 3 times 10 to the minus 15 meters where the strong force kicks in. So the Casimir effect has the same energy and range as the strong force. And then virtual particle interactions cause the weak interactions. Now, oddly enough, W and Z particle theory requires that because they're too massive for them to be, to have mass. Because the WZ mass can't come from anywhere. So they have to be virtual particles. They would have to be a quantum fluctuation. But even then, it doesn't work out because the range is so short that it's shorter than the radius of a proton. So if a W is created inside a proton, it can't get outside to deposit an electron, say in neutron decay. But if you do consider neutron decay and you look at the peak beta decay energy, it's exactly what you would get if the decay was mediated by an electron-positron quantum fluctuation at the pair production energy. So which one's most obvious? The quantum fluctuation one is, not the W and Z model. And then protons and electrons have to come from somewhere if they're being produced. Well, the one place they have to come from is the quantum ether. So again, we have something else to work on. How do you get protons, electrons, and neutrons as well out of the quantum ether. There must be some sort of mechanism. Otherwise, they've been here forever, infinity, but, but if you want a physics where they're produced rather than being here for infinity, then we have to come up with a mechanism. And since we don't have an alternative, they have to come from the ether. And then another big thing is that when physicists look at conservation of energy, they ignore the nearly an infinite amount of energy in the quantum ether. You can't ignore it. That if all these things I've been discussing are true, energy is always flowing in and out of the ether. So the total amount of energy in a region of space is always constant because the energy we usually measure is displaced quantum field energy. So this list shows us that physicists have been making a bunch of problems. And there are a bunch more, but these are really key because they give you a bigger idea of what the picture should like, look like if you incorporate the quantum field theory, the quantum ether, into all of your physics. And if you incorporate it this way, as I try to do, then you can get a coherent picture of physics, a unified field theory, if you would. So I hope you enjoy this video. And if you do, please like, share it with your physicist friends and subscribe for more videos. And I have some books for sale. My book, The Zero Point Universe, describes a lot of these things in it. And my book, The Hunter Gray Slides in Physics, describes a lot of the flaws in the current model because people aren't considering what's going on with the quantum ether. And I want to thank my Patreon, PayPal, and Super Thanks supporters. You help me a lot. And thanks to everyone for watching.